the podcast you've been looking for all along. Step into the life of urban exploration with guests from around the world. Welcome to No Tracers. Welcome back to the No Tracers podcast. My name is K, just the letter K. I'm known as No Tracers. Welcome to the show. The show's all about urban exploring, and I have different guests on every single Friday to share their urban exploring stories and their adventures with you. If you're new to the show, please hit the subscribe button, and if you've been listening for one episode or 50 episodes, please do me a favor and leave a rating and feedback on the show, especially on Apple Podcasts. It helps us grow and find a broader audience. We have hit over 6,000 listens on this show only on Apple Podcasts. So if you guys are listening on other platforms, unfortunately, I can't see the analytics, but for those of you listening on Apple Podcasts, thank you for listening. I appreciate it. If you guys want to see a video version of this podcast, please go to the Just the Letter K YouTube channel, and you can actually watch this episode. You can see my guests' photos and listen to the show at the same time. So this week on the podcast, I'm speaking with Abandoned New England. You can check him out on Instagram. His links are down in the description description and i'm super excited to get into this episode he has some crazy stories to share with you guys a time he got shot at in detroit and uh got arrested and he just had a crazy 24 hours and he's going to be sharing that with you guys he's been to chernobyl he's been all over the east coast he's been all over the place he has tons of maps full of locations and I'm really excited for this episode. Before we get into it, just a couple quick things. If you guys are interested, I have a photography book called No Tracers, An Urban Explorer's Diary. It is a photography book full of my photos and stories of places I've explored, and I would love to give you a signed copy of it. If you head to notracers.com shop, you can pick up a copy there, and I will include a couple of signed photo prints as well for you. You can also see my blog and my videos over on notracers.com. Thank you guys for listening to the show. Lastly, we do have a partner on this podcast, and that is Liquid Death Water. If you've never heard of Liquid Death Water, don't worry. I've got an ad for you in three, two, one. From the streams of the Austrian Alps comes a new kind of water. A water that is sure to raise you from your grave. If you're tired of buying cases of plastic water bottles that contain carcinogens and God knows what else, or if you're trying to lower your waste footprint, Liquid Death comes in beautifully rugged aluminum cans. Murder your thirst with a can of Liquid Death. Check the link in the description and use code just the letter K at checkout for 10% off your order. Liquid death. Murder. Your thirst. So if you'd like to give Liquid Death Mountain Water a try, use code just the letter K for 10% off your order at liquiddeath.com. All right, without further ado, Abandoned New England, please introduce yourself and how long you've been exploring to the No Tracers audience. Hi guys, my name's Ryan. I am, or I go by Abandoned underscore New England. Um, I've been exploring since about 2014. Um, and I started and the day I started exploring, I picked up a camera and kind of never put it down and now it's all I do. (laughs) (laughs) Amazing. So what got you into exploring in the first place? What made you catch this bug? So exploring for me was kind of a unique situation because, um, when I was in high school, um, in 2014, I was a, I would have been a, a junior. Um, I didn't do any drugs. I didn't drink. I didn't smoke. I, I, I would just essentially just like do stupid shit to kind of pass my time. I, I rode dirt bikes. I did essentially any crazy sport you could think of that would fill my time. And well, when it comes to the middle of October and you can't really go dirt biking because there might be snow on the ground and it might be too cold and you can't go snowboarding because there's no snow on the ground my friends would just, you know, go and smoke at night and I was bored and I didn't really have any interest in that and didn't really care for it. So I had to find something to do for myself. And one night I was just scrolling through Insta or I scrolling through Facebook cause I didn't even have an Instagram at the time. And I, and I came across like top 10 most haunted places in Connecticut. And I didn't really care about haunted stuff like that never really piqued my interest at all. I don't really believe in any of that, any of that shit. Um, but it said abandoned hospital. And I was like, well, that sounds cool. I think I'm going to go there. 
And I think I made it about 10 feet on the property before I saw security that night. And I was just like, okay, I need to go back during the day because it was a state park. Um, so I went back during the day and within the first 24 hours of going in there in the early in the morning, pre-dawn, I had bought a camera and found about four or five other abandoned places in the state of Connecticut that I wanted to go. And it just never stopped from there. I just started building out a map and that map at this point has maxed out multiple different folders on Google to the point where I started deleting locations because I had too many. Wow, that's amazing. I know a lot of people that just like start maps and they, they can't really like fill them, but to hear somebody has to like delete their locations, like uh, that kind of like hurts me to hear that you have to do that. But I mean, at this point you probably have like the top ones like memorized at this oh, point. It now. wasn't even me deleting it. The app actually got the Google maps. When you get to 500 locations um, for their like pin maps, um, it starts deleting itself. Anything over 500, it will delete the oldest pin because Google's idea is that, oh, there's no way that this person could possibly remember 500 spots and they're probably just adding more, so just start deleting them. So then I had to go from the yellow stars to the green flags and I've maxed, I've pretty much maxed out the green flags, but what I've started doing is because I have an iPhone, I can't have my maps, like Google my maps on my phone. So what I have to do is I have to go back onto the computer when I get home and I have to take all of those locations and build a my maps page for it to start pulling them back before they start to get deleted. So now I have like three different my maps, one that's really broad and all over the place. Then I have like Eastern European and then I have Western European and then I have miscellaneous. It's, it's gotten really chaotic, but I don't have time to fix it because it would take me days. So it is what it is. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. Absolutely. Can you take me more into that first exploration and what, what made you like continue doing this? Like I, you said earlier, like it just didn't stop from there. Like what, what was it about like, or what is it about the mentality of, ur of an urban explorer that makes us do this? Like for you, what makes you do this? So it's a couple things. Um, because when I first started exploring, I was in high school, so I was obviously bored and it gave me something to do. But the main reason that I kept going back is I just thought it was so interesting. Like people just walk away from these places and then they're just left to decay. So my personal favorite things, especially at the beginning, were a lot of hospitals, a lot of asylums. And like I'd, I'd roll up to these places and there'd be like beautiful late 1800s architecture, gothic, late stage, uh, uh, what's the other one, uh, Victorian. And they just walk away. Like it's, they walk away like it's pointless. Even the places are registered as a historic places. It's still like, oh, whatever. Like this costs too much money to maintain. And I just thought it was so interesting. Um, all of the different things that I would find and all the different architecture. Architecture was like the main thing for me because it's, I actually originally wanted to be an architect when I was younger, but I kind of like stepped out of that. And, but the joy in seeing the different styles never kind of left. And once I started getting exploring, I, I just appreciated the buildings so much that it just kept me kept me going and then the other side of it was um i've always found just more comfort in abandoned places I, I i like the i like the silence and i like the like essentially completely detached from society i've always found that very interesting and very comforting in a way yeah i often tell people that don't explore like what it's like to go in these places it's almost you're like you're walking into a portal to another time and it's like everything outside of that building just falls away and it's completely silent and it's it's so fascinating to me so i i totally yeah, get I what mean, you're saying from that aspect there's like my, my favorite place in the world is like this abandoned theater not far from me and i've probably been about 50 times to it and i will bring people that uh, like ask me to go with them because they know I know it so well, because it's a really well-known place. I'm sure you know, you know of it. Um, and I'll just like, I've shot so many photos there that 
while people are shooting, I'll just kind of like sit in one of the seats on the upper deck and just kind of like enjoy it. Like can do completely nothing. Just sit there and look around and enjoy the architecture and the silence of it, despite it's close proximity to a police station and the consistent sirens that go past it. It's like, it doesn't even bother me when I'm in there surprisingly. Yeah, I, I think that's so interesting. Like we have a uh, an old YMCA building with this like teal painted room that has a Olympic sized pool in it. And it's like next to a police station as well. And it's just, it's so crazy how when you're in there, like nothing bothers you on the outside. Yeah, I, I, I wait, if that's in LA, I think I've been there, like the LA area. <laughs> I'm ready. Oh, the, yeah, yeah I, I think I've been there. It is. <laughs> so I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's amazing. I love it. Um, can you talk about your favorite gear that you use? This could be your camera, your backpack, a pair of shoes you wear, a light, anything like so that? So I am a huge gear fiend. Like, I, I, I always have been, and I don't think that will ever change because every single time new gear gets released, I'm just like always on top of it. And since I am a full-time photographer and I am a full-time videographer, um, I'm constantly like always keeping in tune with the, with what the newest thing is and trying to upgrade to make sure I can stay on top of that, like the quality of gear that I use. Um, but my favorite gear that I probably use is probably my 12 to 24. That lens is just incredible. It's actually, um, so it's full frame lens. So 12 mil, um, freakishly wide. I, I use it a lot for work too, um, for real estate photography, but freakishly wide lens. It is actually, I bought it from another explorer, um, Fran sketchy Johns. Um, good friend of mine, he sold it to me at the beginning of COVID. And I have just like, I haven't, I sometimes shoot bandos on like longer lenses, like fairly recently, but the 12 to 24, oh, the, the size, the compactness, and it gets everything possible in the shot. I just, I can't not use it at a location. It's just amazing. I love it. Um, and then the other thing um, is going to be another lens because I don't really care about the camera that I use as long as it takes decent photo, as long as it like can take a decent resolution photo. I don't really care. Um, but my other favorite lens um, specifically is a lens that was built 51 years ago. Now it's actually a originally a Canon film lens. Um, it's called an FD 50 mil 1.4 SSC. Um, SSC was the type of coating on the front of it. And the look that it gives off when you shoot bandos with it takes you back about 40 to 50 years in the softness and the kind of like the flares that it lets off. It looks, it looks like if you add some, if you add some film grain into the final shot, it looks like you might've taken a shot with a film camera 50 years ago and then got it developed. And I, I just like, I can't beat that lens um, from wow. any other standpoint. I, I love that thing. And it, co and it cost me $0. My buddy gave it to me. Wow. That's amazing. I love like artistic stuff like that. Like you definitely have an eye for, for the art of what we do. And I think that's so fascinating. You're not just taking your pictures. You're, you're actually thinking about like the art behind it and the, the development process behind it as well. And I think that's absolutely amazing. Um, do you have any urban exploration injury stories that you can share? Um, not really. I, for the most part have been relatively lucky. Um, I think the only real injury that I've gotten from exploring was I, I, I had a, a knee injury. Um, when I dropped a little bit too far, I was coming out of a theater. Um, and there was the, the gate was open when I went in, but the gate was closed when I came out. Um, so I wanted to get out of there rather quickly. Um, and the top of the gate is not just like, you can't just like go over it. It's a, you have to like kind of squeeze through cause there's like, there's a ceiling. It's like a, it's like an enclosed alleyway. And I had to like rock the fence back and forth to push myself through it. And when I let go of the fence to drop, like usually like I did free running for years. So like usually when I drop, I'm fine. But what happened was my bag caught on the fence when I dropped 
and it caused me to land on my heels on concrete from a, about 12 feet, which usually, like, if I was landing on concrete from 12 feet, I would just roll out of it, and I'd be fine. It would hurt a little bit, but I'd be fine. But, like, I landed on my heels, and I just felt pain go straight up my to my kneecap. And then I, like, sl- like tried to limp away quickly because I just made so much noise, and it was I was trying to get out of there because there were so many cars driving by. <laughs> But it, it hurt for like two weeks, and then I just oh said that I was fine. Well, I'm glad you've remained relatively unscathed. Other than that, uh, we've heard some crazy stories about people like getting impaled on fences, and you know, all kinds of crazy, oh, crazy oh, shit that's happened uh, throughout the episodes of the show. That so I've been with I'm glad you've gotten impaled. Oh, yeah, Friends that I've been with have gotten impaled. Uh, a girl that I was dating a few years back, um, she actually um, was climbing over a fence, and it was one of the fences where they just clipped the top of it, so it's like kind of like barbed wire, but not actually. Um, and her hand went like it literally went straight into her hand. Um, but she was like, "I'm not, I'm not like not going in here now. Like it has to be worth it." So she um, tourniquet. Uh, her hand with my sweatshirt and just like toughed it out for the rest of the day. Um, oh, I, I do have another injury actually that I'm just thinking of now. Literally the day before uh, the day before this, um, I was climbing into a old um, tower at an airport, so like airport uh, airport control tower, and um, it was snowing. And it was just a wide open window. So like, I'm thinking like, okay, like people probably go in here all the time, like whatever, but there was snow all over the ground. And so I like jumped through the window and then I just like immediately feel something go through my foot. And I'm like, Oh, Oh, Oh no. Um, and then I kind of like look down and I can like, and I, I was wearing boots too. So like, I was surprised that it went through. Um, but like, I looked down and I could see like this little, like this little peak, in my in my shoe like where it would like as if something was sticking up touching the bottom or the top of my shoe and like making it kind of have like a peak and i i realized that i just had a nail go through my foot (laughs) so i so i just kind of like slowly pulled my foot up and then just called my doctor my doctor was like yeah you should probably go to the er i was like when when did i get my tetanus shot she was like no it doesn't matter like go to the er i was like when was my tetanus shot she goes three years ago i was like so I'm good. And she's like, yeah, but you should go to the ER. And I'm like, okay, thanks. I hung up and I just kept going. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. The things we do for it the exploration. I love it. And then, uh, can you tell me about your, sk- no, oh, it wasn't? <laughs> oh God. <laughs> oh, that sucks. Yeah, man. whatever. <laughs> Oh no, that's so sad. Uh, can you tell me about your scariest exploration? Uh, so there was a there was a prison that I really wanted to go to, and it was one of those places where like all the locals kind of knew it existed, but no one really ever did it because they knew of the consequences of getting caught there. And I I have actually two stories for this, so this is my first one. Um, and so I was like, okay, like it can't be that bad. Now I, this was 2018. So I was like, still like sub 21 years old, still a jackass, still like, Oh, I'm, I'm 20 years old. Nothing's going to happen to me. Like I'm fine. Um, so I went to this place at like four 30 in the morning and I, and I got in no, no problems. Um, but the one thing that's really bad about this place is that it's surrounded by four active prisons and they do training in the abandoned one um on weekends sometimes and so like i'm in there and i start like hearing stuff outside and like obviously there's cars driving by and obviously it's a prison property so there's plenty of police cars around and like just the entire time that i was in there every noise i heard just like sent me through the roof like horrified because I, like i knew that like y- like there's literally a sign on the property that says no photographs like even exteriors like no photographs so like i'm thinking like okay not only would i be an e and trespassing yeah. but i would violate the the state code that was on that sign 
and they would probably remove all of my gear from my possession while I sit in jail for what, however length of time before they release me. And then the charges I would get from it. So I was like bugging out the entire time. I think I was in there all of an hour before I couldn't stand it anymore and had to leave. Cause it was either staying there all day or leave before the sun fully came up. So I was like, I need my one shot. I've been here, I've seen it. It was cool, now it's time to go. And I just like booked it out, like as fast as I could possibly run to my car. And then like the second I get to the car, just like I watched this cop just drive by, right where I had left. Just like casually driving by, like he probably didn't know I was there, but it's just like the thought of like, wow, if I, if I did this like 30 seconds later, like how screwed I would be right now. Um, so that was the first one that sucked. Mm. That really drove wow. me nuts, and I like still want to go back, but I know like I don't need to, and I'm like resisting it. Um, my actual scariest explore was over the course of about 24 hours. It was just like the worst, probably the worst 24 hours of my life, um, because I was in I was in Detroit, of course, um, and I was with some people that were like friends of a friend, and. Before we met up to them, they were just like, oh, you should go check out this stadium that they're demolishing, which was the Detroit Pistons Stadium. Um, so we went over there, and we were shooting it, and it was fine. There was nobody there. Mm -hmm. And then as we're starting to leave, the construction workers start coming onto the property. And we're just like, oh, well, we definitely need to leave now. So we're, like, running across the parking lot and diving into, like, those little, like, median sections between parking spaces where there were some bushes just so that when like a worker would drive by to park his truck he wouldn't see us so we were just like diving 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 we finally got out of there after about half an hour and when we walked by um to get back to our car because you had to walk past the entrance to get to where you parked um there was like 15 cars in there there, there was loaded like when we had gotten there there was nobody by the time we left there was 15 cars it's like this was very lucky. So then like an hour later, we're in a school with the people that we finally meet up with. And there's like a bunch of banging going on. Like you can t clearly tell that someone's in there and it's Detroit. And you don't want to run into these people in Detroit because it's one thing in like one of the smaller local mills. It's like sometimes a homeless person. They usually don't bother you. But like the amount of times I've heard of people getting robbed in buildings and houses in Detroit, I was like, I didn't want to deal with it. And so we like quickly booked it out of there again. So that's, that's, a, that's a twofer so far for the day. And then we hit a couple other things that weren't really a big deal, um, drove around, saw the basic stuff. Um, and then the end of the day, we decided we wanted to go check out this church. My buddy was like, yeah, I went there a few years ago. It was fine. Like, it's pretty easy. You just go in the side window and you're good. It's like, okay, like you ever have any problems there? He's like, oh, there used to be alarms, but they're, they're not, they don't work anymore. And I was like, oh, okay, whatever. Um, so we're, we park like too close for comfort in my opinion, but he was a local. So I wasn't going to like tell him like, shouldn't we park somewhere else? Cause like, I figured like, he knows what he's doing, like whatever. Um, and we go inside and I, I'm taking pictures and then my girlfriend just looks at me and she goes, did you just hear what he said? And I was like, no, what'd he say? And he's like, he was here seven years ago. And last time he was here, he got shot at. And I was like, you wait till now to tell us this? Like, we're inside, it's getting dark out, and you wait till now to tell us that last time you were here, you got shot at. And he's like, oh, it's no big deal. It was like seven years ago, dude. There's no way it happens again. Bullshit. Bullshit. Because, like, three minutes later, I look outside, and there's this truck slow rolling our cars. And I'm like, okay, we need to go. Like, this Detroit, someone just slow rolled our cars. We're out of state plates. We need to get the hell out of here, like, right now. And we start walking down the same way that we came in, like not a step outside of where we had come in and the alarm goes off. It's like, what the fuck? Like, did someone just remotely trigger this alarm? Like, what the hell? So we get out, we climb out and we run to the other end of the property to hop over the fence on the other side, not where we had originally entered, but away from where the guy was slow rolling our cars. And we get out and my friend and his girlfriend are still climbing out. Me and my girlfriend are already out on the other side of the street. And we're like walking on the other side, complete other side of the street, like towards our cars, just like, you know, minding our own business where we didn't do anything wrong. 
And uh, that clearly didn't work because the dude rolls up on us and he goes, did you just go in there? And I was like, no, what are you talking about? And he's like, were you just in there? I was like, no. And he's like, is that your car? And I'm like, yeah. He's like, you sure? I'm like, yes. And he goes, bullshit. And I was like, fuck. So me and my girlfriend sprint, like dead sprint to my car, get in my car. The dude rolls up in his truck and tries to box us in. And I backed out, mounted the curb and just took off down the street. And I got maybe like a hundred feet away before I hear pop, 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 pop. Dude firing bullets at my car as I'm flying down the street. And I had like, I was like, okay, I'm leaving Detroit right now. Like I left Detroit at probably a buck 20 on the highway. Like no, no fucks given. Like, I don't care if I get pulled around, I'm getting the fuck out of this city. <laughs> and I, I'm trying to like get in touch with, with my friend. I'm like, dude, are you okay? Are you okay? Cause he was taking longer to get out. He was still there when I had left. Um, and he, he texted me back. He's like, yeah, we're, we're, we're fine. I was like, dude, like, I'm sorry I left, but the dude was fucking firing at us. And he was like, yeah, I know. I heard, dude. And I was like, are you guys okay? He's like, yeah. But he hit me over the head with the butt of his gun, put a gun to his, my head and threatened to end my life. And I was like, bro, that's like <laughs> fucked up. And then apparently a cop wow. rolled up to them. And the guy with the gun, like, helped my buddy stand up. And the cops were like, is everything okay here? My buddy was like, yeah, everything's fine. And the guy with the gun was like, yeah, we're good. The cop was like, okay, just making sure. And then the cop left, and they were like, you better leave now. And my buddy was like, okay, have a good one. Got in his car and fucking took off. But that's not the end of my 24 hours. That's only 12. Wow. So now I'm driving... Oh my God. Now I'm driving <laughs> south to Ohio. I've just had the craziest day of my life. Got shot at. And I'm just like, okay, I have the key to this building that my buddy gave me. Same guy. I should have known at this point. And he's like, and he told me, it's like, yeah, just like it unlocks the padlock in the back door. Just go and take your shots. You're fine. I was like, okay, whatever. Didn't really like put two and two together that he was like it wasn't just a like a walk-in spot again like the last one but whatever um sleep in the car that night wake up at like eight o'clock the next morning just like oh whatever like we have the key it doesn't really matter what time we go in it's back door people will just probably think we own it um and so we walk over to it we get there at about 8 30 open the padlock on the back door walk inside close the door listen for like a few minutes to see if we hear anything and my girlfriend's like, I think I just heard someone outside. And I was like, no, no, your mind's probably just playing tricks on you. You're probably fine. Let's just go in take our shots and then get out of here. And she's like, okay, whatever. And so we go in, so we go in, it's another theater. Um, and we're taking photos and then we just start hearing banging downstairs. And I was like, what the, f what is that? And then we, we start here yelling and banging and we're like, oh my God, is there a homeless student here? And like it continues and then we're like okay let's let's go like away from where he is but let's get downstairs so that when he goes upstairs we can just take off and we get downstairs and like we start to smell shit so we figured it's a homeless dude that just came in here and took a fucking shit and is just losing his mind so we're like downstairs in the closet for a little bit like waiting and then we finally hear him upstairs like banging on shit and now i still have the padlock in my hand with the key in it unlocked Cause I'm going to like run outside. I'm going to lock the door and just get the, like, get out of here. And we run outside and there are, I shit you not eight cop cars sitting outside. And we run outside and we're just like, I just look around and I'm just like, Oh, Oh no. And cop looks at me and he goes, put your hand behind your back. And I was like, fuck. And stuck me in a car, stuck my girlfriend in the car, took all of our shit, brought us straight to lock up didn't say a word to us. And then they started interrogating my girlfriend because they figured like, ah, oh, she's a girl. She's probably the, the, the weak link. She probably got convinced to do this, do this by her boyfriend. And meanwhile, my girlfriend's been exploring longer than me, which made this even more funny. Um, and so they started interrogating her, trying to like get like some dirt. Like they're like, oh, how'd you get in? And she goes, oh, we had the key. You have it in evidence. And he's like, that's that's bull and, he, and she's like no like literally like we have the key and he goes like oh how'd you get the key and she's like our friends gave it to us 
Like, what friends? And she goes, our friends from Detroit. They gave us the key to this place. Like, they said it was fine. We can go take photos of here and then just lock it up on the way out. And he's like, why are you lying to me? She's like, I'm not lying to you. And then he goes, so if I was, like, in North Carolina, I ran into you, and I told you that I had a key for a place in Connecticut, and you would just believe me? And she's like, I know, I would have no reason to not believe you. And he goes, so I don't know why you're lying to me. She's like, I'm not. I don't know what you want me to say, but I'm not lying to you. And the one thing with interrogations is if you say, I don't know what you want me to say, or tell me what you want to say so this will stop, they can't actually respond to you. Because if anything that they tell you to say from that point on is inadmissible because it's coercion. So he got super pissed off, locked, yeah. her, locked her back in the handcuffs, brought her downstairs, slammed the jail door shut, and called her a bitch and walked away. And about 30 seconds later, he found out that we weren't even in his jurisdiction. We had gotten into a county building, not a city building. So then we get transferred to county into much nicer holding cells. These ones had carpet. They had painted walls. It was very nice. Um, and the doors kind of open and one of the guy, one of the detectives is like, should we interrogate them? And the other one goes like, we know what they did. Like, want to just like talk to them? And he was like, yeah, I suppose. So then they bring us both out into the hallway because we were in separate interrogation rooms. They uncuff us and they were like, guys, just tell us what happened. We told them the same exact story that we told the other guys and that we're like, listen, we're just photographers. We're doing a COVID safe road trip because this was in back in April uh, of last year. And we're sleeping in our car. We're just driving around different states, like trying to enjoy a vacation while like my girlfriend wasn't working and I wasn't. And they were like, okay, like you guys seem like good people. You don't seem like there was any intent here, like criminal intent. You guys literally had the key for some reason. I don't know how you got it. And I, I told him like, literally our friend gave it to us. We don't know how he got it. Like, obviously we could distinguish probably how he got it, but and then they're just like, okay, well just don't get caught in the County again today. And you, and you guys are free to go. I'm like, okay, see you later. Like not coming back here again. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. You, you um, talk about social media and what it's like, what it's done for you. Sorry for the delay. <laughs> so I have 17 K obviously. Um, it took me about seven years to get there. Um, I originally started my Instagram literally right when I started exploring, I had no idea there was an exploring community. I was just doing it for myself. It was before exploring really took off on Instagram. Like it was a thing, but it wasn't like there weren't like all these feature accounts, like reposting people. And th there wasn't really a lot of it on Instagram. Um, and I just started posting abandoned places. I, 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 I made an account with my friend called abandoned new England and, um, we just started like exploring different places around Connecticut and posting photos. And it kind of like, I kind of like started to like find out about the community in 2016, like before the massive influx of people, like before there was just like a trillion explorers. Cause like you could still talk to other explorers and just like talk about spots with them. There wasn't like this super like secretive community where like, the, like it is now where like, Oh no, you can't share spots. Don't share spots. It was like, you could talk to anyone and they would be like, yeah, I'll go exploring with you. And like, yeah, there's a cool spot right here that you'd probably love. Like I've been there a bunch of times. Like it, it was like very open and nice and easy going. There was no competition. It was just people liked going to abandoned places and taking photos. And um, the first person I kind of met in the community was uh, actually vanishing New England. Um, his name is Brian. He's actually a good friend of mine. And I explored with him like once or twice and just like stayed in touch. And then like my account wasn't really growing. Like I wasn't that great of a photographer. Like I, I've left all my photos on there. Like people can go back and see how bad they were uh, just to like make themselves feel better about themselves if they're just starting out. Um, and I just like, I, I didn't really like try to do anything with it. I just kind of posted photos cause I liked posting photos of abandoned places. And like, I got like 20 likes, like I didn't really care. And I still don't really care about likes, but I, I got like 20 likes and it made me feel good about myself. Cause I, I, people liked my photos and, um, nothing really came of Instagram for me 
until about 2018. Um, because in 2018, Brian vanishing new England, he actually like, he called me up and he was like, Hey dude, like, what's the chance you want to go to Chernobyl with me? And I was like, dude, fuck yeah. Like, absolutely. Like I, I, no questions asked. Tell me when I'll buy a ticket right now and bought a ticket right now for May, 2018. And he planned out the entire thing with a bunch of people. And, um, it gets, it's getting closer and closer to going there. And like, I'm starting to like broadcast on my stories that like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to Chernobyl. Like I can't wait to go. Like, like keep watching my stories to like see what it's like. I'm going to try to share as much and lot and do live and stuff like that. And I start to like, I'm at like 400 followers right now. Like, but I'm like, then again, I it's, it's like, I'm not, I'm still like, I've never really tried to grow. It's just like kind of been like at its own pace. And I get to like right before Chernobyl and I'm still in college at this point. Like not that it was doing much for me, but um, I was still in college at this point And I was just like, I, I, I was like, okay, I'm going to Chernobyl. Like, this is gonna be awesome. This is gonna be great content for my, for my Instagram. Like I'm so excited. Cause like, it's really a photographer in me. It's less of a Instagram poster. And, um, my teachers kind of told me that I wasn't allowed to take my finals early. And meanwhile, I was supposed to leave on like literally May 3rd, which is like finals week at Connecticut colleges. And they were like, yeah, you, you can't take your finals early. I'm like, well, why not? And they're like, you can take them. You can take a summer course and then take them. Then I'm saying, like, I'm not doing that. Like, fuck that. Like, I, I'm not doing that. Like, let me take my finals early. And they're like, no, I was like, fine. I'm dropping out. And they're like, okay. So I dropped out of college and went to Chernobyl the next day. And then while I was there, I was live streaming, posting a bunch of photos. And this is where Instagram like really took off for me. I posted a photo of a teddy bear with a gas mask on the ground, sitting in a chair with like a bunch of cribs behind it in uh, Pripyat elementary school. And, um, that photo just took off. Like I, I tagged it Chernobyl exclusion zone and it just took off. It was on the front page of that like geo tag for like three weeks. Now at this point I had like 750 followers. I had gone from 400 to 750 while in Chernobyl and I had got that photo got over a thousand likes on it in like 48 hours. And I was like, Holy shit. It's finally taking off. Like all this, like all this time of posting consistently, it's like finally grown. And, um, other than that, Instagram has really just like in introduced me to like a lot of really cool people. Like some of my best friends, um, I've met through Instagram, the person who set me and my girlfriend up who I've now been dating for two years is someone I met on Instagram. Um, I was in a dark spot for a long time and my buddy that I met on Instagram helped get me out of it. Like I like, I have Instagram to thank for a lot of stuff and the people I've met are like the, the main like thing that I've gotten out of it. Like the people of this community, at least the good ones are some of the greatest people I've ever met. And they're my best friends. Hell I'm moving in with someone that I met off Instagram in uh, two months. Like we're moving into an apartment together. It's, it's, it's crazy. Instagram has gone way beyond what I ever expected it to be versus me just posting photos of bandos. Wow. That's incredible. I love hearing how social media brings people together, especially in this community. And like, it has definitely changed over the years. Uh, like you were saying, like with, you know, locations and just talking about what we do, but I love that it's helped bring people into your life that have like, you know, made your life better. I think that's absolutely incredible. Um, do you prefer to explore alone or with people? So, I am a big advocator of never explore alone. Um, I, I think that it's, it's a dangerous hobby and I've had a lot of friends that have gotten hurt and gotten injuries or gotten arrested and no one knew where they were. Like, I, I don't think that exploring alone is ever a good idea. Um, I, I think that with at least one person, I try to make it like, I prefer a group of three because if someone goes down, you have two people to get them out. Um, and I, I think that like exploring with people is also like, I don't like exploring alone, even like take the, take the injuries and possibilities of bad things out of it. I just don't like exploring alone because like the places are cool and I love to see them, but like 
it's no fun seeing stuff and experiencing stuff alone. Like if you get to experience something with friends, that is like takes that already cool thing and makes it a true memory versus like, oh yeah, I remember when I went there, that was cool. Versus like, oh dude, you remember when we hit this spot and like all this, like we saw this really cool stuff. Like it's, it's, it's more enjoyable with friends than it is exploring by yourself. And it's just safer too. Like there's, there's two sides of it. Um, but yeah, I, I prefer to explore with, with people. And the reasoning behind it is absolutely fantastic. You know, I, I completely agree. I think you should always have somebody with you. I've done a few explorations solo and I definitely prefer to be with people, especially with the thing, considering the things you were talking about, injuries, the risk of getting arrested, things like that. Um, and then, so Chernobyl is a lot of people's bucket list item for you what are your bucket list items like what places have you not been to yet that you want to go to so chernobyl is still like bucket list for me like i've been there and i've shot it i was there in the zone for three days like i was in i was in i was in ukraine for a total of six but it's like i I, i'm like i'm still going back at some point like i i honestly miss it because it was such a cool place to be and there's so much history like i've been a chernobyl nut since well before i was ever into exploring like 2010 i was like researching it like i was 13 years old and i was just in love with the idea of chernobyl i just thought it was the coolest thing ever i like obviously a horrible tragedy but like the amount of like disinformation that kind of came out of it the cover-up the world finding out about it and the cleanup process and like as you've probably seen the new hbo ser- mini series on chernobyl like it was just all so interesting mm-hmm. and it's still like bucket list item for me even though i've been there like i can't get enough of it i want to go back like two or three more times before i can say that like i'm all set but as for bucket list items uh there's one that replaced chernobyl as my number one once i found out about it and and after i went to chernobyl um, and that's the the space shuttles. That's the um, the Bankinor space mm. shuttles, which I believe that me and Greg are going to be doing, um, as well as my girlfriend next year, hopefully. But it's going to be there's going to be a lot of planning, a lot of training involved with that. Um, number two, I ha- I still have on my list as Chernobyl, even though I, even though I've been there. Um, the next really like big spots for me. Um, are still a lot of spots that pe- other people like are dying to go to. So like a main one that a lot of people know, uh, my buddy Steve has been there a ton of times, uh, Battleship Island in Japan, um, Hashima Island, uh, where it's an old mining town built on an island and they mine straight down into the island um, to get coal. And I thought, I think that place is incredibly cool. So that's, that's pretty high up on my list. Um, another spot that's like top of my list. And I know that they're restoring it right now. And the chance of me actually getting there before it's like completely ripped apart for restoration is, uh, Casina Constanta, um, in, in Romania, uh, in Constanta, Romania, that place is just like amazing. And it's been on, it hasn't been on my list for that long, but it's, 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 it's really beautiful and it has everything you could ever want. It has beautiful, beautiful staircases, immaculate gothic architecture um uh, that crazy chandelier that i'm sure you've seen and me just saying that you probably know what i'm talking about the theater in it is so cool Mm. the window that they have in that theater is like a picture in itself um and then the last spot that's like always comes to mind and has been on my list for a long time is uh the buzzlada in uh Bulgaria, the giant Soviet um, monument to commun- to the Communist Party that they built on top of a mountain with the iron fists. Though that place is just incredible. Um, and I'm, mm. I'm trying to do a lot of that stuff all on the same trip, but uh, COVID kind of put a stop to it. So now I'm just waiting uh, until I have the funds to pull it off. Well, hey, I wish you the best of luck with that. Um, if you could live in one place, like in a building that you've explored for one week, which place would it be? Oh, uh, play. Can I can I do places that are no longer around? 
Yeah, of course. So if I were to choose like a place that I could just be for a week and just like continuously shoot, um, it would have to be either the original Norwich State Hospital in Connecticut, like tw like 2008 before they demolished anything, um, or um, uh, Trenton Psychiatric Hospital, which is like known to be completely untouchable. I've always wanted to get in there. It's like almost impossible. Um, from what I've heard, impossible. Um, and I just like always wanted to see it. Like the, the Kirk brides, they just kill me. And like, they're all I really care about. Like when it comes to, um, abandoned places, because those are the ones that are disappearing the fastest. And if I could have a chance to document and see all of that architecture yeah. before it's gone, I would try to maximize that. And if we're talking about places that I've never seen before and that have been gone for almost 40 years now, um, there was a Kirkbride in upstate New York. I'm not going to give the name of it because it, some of the buildings are still around. Um, but there's a Kirkbride up there that they demolished in the eighties. Um, and there's like only two photos of it from that I found in existence and to see the inside of that and document it and like have the history of it. Um, I, I would just kill for that. Yeah, absolutely. And then uh, my final question for you is, what is something you know now that you wish you knew when you started exploring? Uh, well, from a photography standpoint, I wish I would have just, you know, shot stuff level and straight on. That, that's a big one because, like, my shots from, like, the early <laughs> days are just, like, I'm pissed off when I try to edit them because there's not there's, they're not either not wide enough or they're so angled that I can't crop them to be straight and fix them. Um, but if there was like one thing that I would like tell myself at the beginning, like 2014, back when I started, it would be hit every single place you possibly can because it's going to be gone faster than you can imagine. And the same stays true from today. Like the amount of places that we've lost in the area that I'm from in Connecticut and Massachusetts, the amount of, Kirk prize have demolished churches that have been demolished. Like I just wish that I knew what would happen to them if I skipped them or a pre wish I appreciated places that I had seen more because now I can't see them again. Definitely. Definitely. Thank you for coming on the show. If people want to keep following your journey, where can they find you online? Drop your social media, drop your print shop, anything you want to say. So my social media is um, at abandoned underscore new England on Instagram. I don't have a Twitter other than my personal. I don't have a Facebook for it other than my personal. I primarily just Instagram. That's like all it will ever be. Cause it's not a job to me and it's fun and I don't want to make it something beyond that. I have a print shop in my description there. Um, and every once in a while I'll be seen in some YouTube videos of my friends, like the proper people, Urbex and chill and some of those guys. Um, but that's, that's about it. Pretty much just Instagram. All right. That was my episode with abandoned new England. If you guys want to check out his photography, definitely go do so. His links are down in the description to both his Instagram and his print shop on darkroom.tech. If you guys are interested in supporting him and grabbing a photo, that'd be super sick. If you're new to the podcast, please hit the subscribe button. If you've been listening for one episode or 50 episodes, please leave a rating and feedback, especially on Apple podcasts. It helps us grow and find a broader audience. Again, my name is Kay. You can find me at no.tracers on Instagram or no tracers on TikTok or just the letter K on YouTube. Thank you guys for listening. I'll talk to you again next Friday with another guest. If you want to come on the show, please DM me. I would love to have you on here. And as always, stay strong, keep enduring, go out, go explore something, and remember, leave no trace.